You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. This episode of The Pet Doctor is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at audiblepodcast.com forward slash pet doctor. Over 75,000 titles to choose from for your iPod or MP3 player. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance, and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. What a spectacular time of year, spring. We're so over the thrill of that first flakes of snow, those cozy nights by the fire wrapped in your Snuggie. It's getting pretty old now. Spring is your chance to clean the cobwebs out of your home and mine. But one of the things you have to be careful as you're trying to spring clean are some of the products that we're using. They are not all created equal when it comes to being safe, even if it says it's organic and it's natural. We want to make sure that they're safe around you, your family, and your pet. My guest is Dr. Justine Lee. She's a board-certified emergency and critical care veterinary specialist and current associate director of veterinary services for Pet Poison Hotline. She'll give us some pointers on how to safely declutter and deep clean our homes. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Hey, boy, how you doing? What am I doing? I'm creating your own life book. It's a website that's just for you. Remember that picture I took of you pulling off Lisa's bathing suit? (laughs) Yeah, I know. Me too. I'm putting that awesome picture on your life book page. We'll see what comments we get. And that great video we took of you standing on the table with your head inside the turkey? That's definitely going on there. No, it's easy. It only took me two minutes to set up your page. I chose a great theme, and I can connect with millions of other pet parents. I can also create a memorial life book. (coughs) No, not for Grandma, but we can make one for Fluffy, remember her? And we can even put links to our favorite pet charity. And friends can make donations. People can create their own life book for their pets by going to PetLifeRadio.LivingYearsPets.com or they can sign up on the Pet Life Radio homepage. (coughs) Where's Lisa? She's outside by the pool. Hey, come back here. (coughs) Create your own life book for your pet. PetLifeRadio.LivingYearsPets.com Hi, and welcome to the Family Pet on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Colleen Safford. Each week, we'll focus on different topics, child pet safety, child pet training, just how to make an appropriate pet selection for your family. All of these things will be covered in each one of our episodes. So we hope that you will join us at The Family Pet on Pet Life Radio. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Lee, you always have great information. Thanks for being on the show again. No problem. Thanks for having me on. Well, I don't know about you. I really don't like cleaning, but I know that it's necessary and there's just something about it being so nice outside. It's like, okay, get in there and really clean. And it's confusing sometimes when I go and try to find products that says, oh, it's organic or it's natural or it's environmentally friendly. Sometimes that's not always the truth. Is that correct? 
That is true. You do have to be a bit careful with certain types of uh, spring cleaning products to use. One in that I always recommend checking with your veterinarian um, because not all quote unquote pet safe products that are labeled that way are safe. And one example is citrus cleaners. So a lot of people will buy them because they seem like they're organic. But cats are really sensitive to citrus oils such as D-lemonene. And so it's a type of oil that's actually naturally found in citrus oil. And the problem is with exposure to it, they can actually develop really severe reactions. So when in doubt, always check with your vet or with Pet Poison Helpline to make sure it's not poisonous. Some of the very common products that we'll have out there, and I'm always just shocked when a pet comes in and it's been licking lye. The people don't use lye all that frequently anymore, or it's licked bleach and things that seem to be really caustic, you know, hard smelling. Ugh, it just makes your eyes tear up. But pets and children will lick it, swallow it. What are the real problems that people will see and what should they look for? Great question. Most of the general cleaners that you have out there are usually safe. So if you're talking about things like surface cleaners or glass cleaners, those are those have what we call a wide margin of safety. So your pet actually has to chew into the whole bottle before we would actually um, worry about a poisoning per se. They can cause mild signs like vom- a little bit of vomiting, a little bit of diarrhea, or even some skin irritation. Um, and the problem is that while most of these products are safe, there are some that are really strong chemicals. They're what we call acidic or alkaline cleaners. So you're right. If it smells bad, if it smells strong, if you if it says to wear gloves and to ventilate the air appropriately, those are ones you want to be really careful about with your pets. And your classic example are toilet bowl cleaners, lye, drain cleaners, calcium or lime removers, and rust removers. Products like that are corrosive and they can cause burns to the skin, burns to the mouth, and even burns to the eyes. And the problem is that people think that those burns are going to happen right away. They might not actually see evidence of those burns for four to six up to 12 hours. So just because your dog got into it and you don't see any problems directly doesn't mean that it's not going to cause a problem later on. Good to know. So if it's something that we need to wear gloves and keep in a a well-ventilated area, very likely it's going to be a problem for our pets. And I don't know about you, but, you know, I'm in the house, you know, on my knees cleaning something. And, of course, the pet has to be right there. It's like, hi, what are you doing? Can I help? Mm -hmm. And they always seem to be wanting to get into it. Floor cleaners, you know, you want to have nice, clean floors. What are some products to safely use and what are some that we should stay away from? Yeah, most of the floor cleaners are relatively safe, Um, especially if they're wood cleaners, things like that, like Murphy's oil, things like that are generally very, very safe. And remember, they're safe because they're usually diluted. The problem is, especially for cats, animals that are what we call fastidious groomers, they like to clean their fur a lot, so cats that walk across a wet floor and then lick all that product off can cause, can develop some signs of toxicity if you're using a very concentrated product. So if it's a dilute product and it's diluted appropriately and you just clean the floor, that's usually not an issue. The issue is if you pour a concentrated product like pine oil into a bucket and your pet drinks right out of the bucket, that causes a problem. So when in doubt, I generally recommend keeping pets out of the house or out of the room while you're cleaning. Keep your dog in a fenced-in yard. Keep your cat in a separate room while you clean the rest of the area. And more importantly, for people who have birds, birds have a really unique anatomy, and they're very, very sensitive to any kind of fragrance. And so using things like air fresheners, uh, using certain types of aerosolized chemicals, I never recommend using them if you have birds. So if you do want to spring clean, take your bird in the secured cage outside, um, wait till the area is really well ventilated. Once the product's completely dry, you can't smell the, the chemical anymore, then it's generally safe to bring your bird back into the environment. Um, but with certain species, you want to be really careful. Dr. Lee, from Pet Poison Hotline, I should mention. With birds, you're saying you have to be so careful having these air fresheners. Now, a lot of people like using these little plug-in aromatherapy type of products. Are those as much of a problem as ones that you spray in the air? 
The plug-in products are generally much safer than the ones that you're spraying in the air, especially for birds. The one thing I would caution people about using, especially if they have cats, is using liquid potpourri. So things that you have to heat over a little tea like candle, those are concentrated essential oils that are poisonous to your cat. So if your cat takes one or two licks um, just because they see this warm, fragrant liquid, it can actually cause really severe corrosive burns in the mouth and in esophagus. So when in doubt, I generally avoid the liquid potpourris. The plug-ins are generally very safe. Um, and even the aerosols are generally safe. But if you have a pet with a problem, so if your cat has asthma or your dog has chronic bronchitis, I generally recommend using caution or checking with your veterinarian regarding that. Those kitties are so sensitive as compared to dogs, so people do need to be extra aware. Now, natural being considered safe. Can you give us some examples of some natural products? You mentioned the citrus. Are there other things that are out there? Uh, For instance, you'd mentioned a little bit about um, parasites, fleas and organophosphates. Um, People will sometimes try to use pennyroyal or use Mm -hmm. garlic as a flea repellent. Do these things work and are they safe? That's a great question. They are not safe. Um, One in doubt, going natural or holistic does not always mean safe. We actually get called quite frequently at Pet Poison Helpline by owners who are trying a holistic natural approach to get rid of fleas and they end up using an essential oil like pennyroyal oil or winter, you know, wintergreen oil, things like that. Those essential oils can actually cause a temporary paralysis in both dogs and cats. So it makes them walk like they're drunk. They may not be able to walk at all. Granted, it's transient. It usually only lasts about two days, but you definitely want to be very, very careful about using those products. Um, The example that you use garlic, we eat garlic all the time. Dogs and cats, if they eat a certain amount, especially chronically, it's poisonous. And most of the time, most veterinary parasitologists will tell you those holistic methods, unfortunately, don't work. So brewer's yeast, garlic, the essential oils, those aren't effective versus using a safer flea tick prescription medication from your veterinarian. Another example that I had mentioned before, things like the citrus oil, a lot of the natural essential oils that are out there, again, be very, very careful. The products that are poisonous, anything can be poisonous in large amounts. Okay, or in toxic amounts. So even, you know, I'm a huge advocate of using natural cleaners like vinegar or baking soda. But if your dog gets into a whole box or even a significant amount of baking soda, that's poisonous. It contains a lot of salt, which is poisonous. So when in doubt, you always want to pet proof your house appropriately. Well, I think you're just giving me all these reasons why I shouldn't clean my home. So (laughs) I can't vacuum frequently. This is my excuse and I'm sticking with it because one of my cats is panicked by the vacuum cleaner. I won't see that cat for a day after I go ahead and vacuum. So I try not to get that cat too upset too often. So yes, flea products. Dr. Justine, you were saying that people trying to use all these holistic products. Right now on the news, they're hearing a lot about FDA investigating these flea products. Could you chime in a little bit what you feel are some of the safe ones to use, ones people should be concerned with, even if they're finding it at their pet store? What are the good ones? That's a great question. You know, Pet Poison Helpline actually just collaborated with the EPA and Canada's P. MRA, which is the Canadian version of the EPA, and we basically looked at um, adverse events and basically looked at the data to find out whether or not those topical spot-on products, whether or not they're prescription or whether or not they're over-the-counter were dangerous. And the good thing is what we found is that the majority of um, the adverse events were usually very minor and definitely non-life-threatening. Okay. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing is a disproportionate amount of, um, and I'm going to say it bluntly, hype about the product. That's because there are so many thousands of doses that are being used. The likelihood of having a side effect is relatively rare, um, but one in doubt, there's usually a 1-800 medical line on the back of the product that you're using. So one in doubt, you can always call that number or call your veterinarian for guidance. Okay. The important thing on what this study with the EPA and Pet Poison Helpline found was that the biggest problems that we were seeing was when it was a misuse. Owners weren't using the product appropriately. 
So they either bought a product for a small dog and used it on a big cat. And because cats have a really altered liver metabolism, they can't handle the same drugs. And so putting a very, very safe spot-on product on a dog is fine. But if you put certain types on cats, it can cause cats to seizure and tremor. So definitely poisonous to cats. So making sure you read and follow the directions on the product, regardless of what type of product you use correctly. The next thing is making sure you're using it on the right species, okay? And then the third thing is we saw a lot of misuse from pet owners that actually don't know the exact size and weight of their pet. And so they were actually overdosing their pet with the product, which resulted in a lot of the symptoms. My general guideline is have your pet weighed at your vet once or twice a year just so you know what the weight is and record it so you know that. I always tell people one gallon of milk is eight pounds. So if you think your little teacup chihuahua is less than eight pounds, you have to be very, very careful. Okay, same thing with kittens or small cats. So when in doubt, weigh your animal, weigh your pet before applying any flea and tick medications. It may seem a bit self-serving, but I'll always tell my clients, you know, you're trying, of course, especially in this economy, to find the most cost-effective way of keeping your pet healthy and happy. And especially in Southern California, we need to have flea control year-round because they're always there. It never gets that cold. Many places, a lot of these products now are heartworm, internal parasite, and flea protective. And we used to say, well, just use it during, quote-unquote, the flea season or use it during the heartworm season. But it seems as though these parasites can be around bothering your pet, being potentially injurious year-round. So using it year-round keeps you in this habit of using it every 30 days. You pay the mortgage, give your pet, you know, it's flea heartworm medication. And talk to your veterinarian. That's your veterinarian and your staff are trained to tell you what is going to be the safest, best for your pet. And sometimes going to the pet store, going to these big box stores, you see a product that maybe looks very similar to what you saw at your veterinary office and going, wow, the product there was $60 for a six-month supply and this is only 20 Wow, my vet's really trying to rip me off. So I buy this product to find out Though it may look the same and be applied the same, they are very far from being the same. And that safety margin could be much, much, much lower. You had talked a a little bit, Dr. Justine, about uh, having these Penny Royal essential oils. A story that I have when I was in veterinary school, I went camping with a uh, fellow classmate of mine, and she and I thought we'd be very holistic. And at our local holistic grocery store, they had these Penny Royal flea collars for dogs going, wow, it prevents the fleas from jumping on you. It repels mosquitoes. It's safe. It's organic. We'll buy one of those. And they looked cute, too. So we put it around our necks. Oh, my goodness. The smell was just so hellacious, was so strong. After that, I felt sorry for any pet that any pet owner would try to put these things on because these poor little animals couldn't breathe. We had to take the things off. Yeah, and that's important. You bring up a great point because I've actually tried some of those holistic mosquito lotions also with um, lemongrass or with pennyroyal oil, and I have not found them to be very effective. And that's when I'm traveling around the world. And that's when you have to think about the potential side effects of what the organism can give you. So it reduces my chances of getting malaria or it reduces your dog's chances of getting Ehrlichia or Lyme disease. It's oftentimes more effective and better for your pet to make sure that you're preventing any kind of disease transmission. So when in doubt, ask your veterinarian. Well, I'm going to ask you right now to stay tuned. We're going to take a short little break for a commercial and be right back with Dr. Justine Lee of the Pet Poison Hotline. So stay tuned. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Hey, love to read, but just never seem to have enough time to sit in one place long enough? For all of us on-the-go people, Audible has the answer. Best-selling audiobooks for your iPod or MP3 player. For Pet Life Radio listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 14-day trial to give you a chance to check out their service. 
Choose from hundreds of today's bestsellers, including awesome pet books, such as Bad Dogs Have More Fun by Marley and the author John Grogan, Love That Cat by Ingrid Newkirk, It's Okay to Miss the Bed on the First Jump, and Other Life Lessons I Learned from Dogs by Seinfeld's John O'Hurley, and many, many more. To download your free audiobook today, go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash pet doctor. Again, that's audiblepodcast.com forward slash pet doctor for your free audiobook. It's time for school for you and your friends, your furry best friends. Train your dog the fun and easy way with Teacher's Pet Sessions. Teacher's Pet host Pia Silvani teaches you step-by-step how to train your dog the fun and easy way. You get eight 30-minute live audio training sessions, complete transcripts of each session, plus a basic training manual to get you and your dog off to a great start. Training begins the moment you bring your dog home. Teacher's Pet Sessions offers positive reinforcement training to shape your dog's behavior and encourages upbeat, enthusiastic responses to ensure that your dog will enjoy learning. Teacher's Pet Sessions dog training is fun at both ends of the leash. So listen, learn, and laugh with your dog with Teacher's Pet Sessions. Get your copy of Teacher's Pet Sessions Volume 1 today. To order, go to teacherspetsessions.com. Hi, this is Pia Salvani, your host. Bring your dog, tug toy, and treats, and get ready to have some fun. Teacherspetsessions.com. Hello! I'm Deborah Wolf, and I'm inviting you to my animal party on Pet Life Radio. The dress code? Come as you are. Pajamas, a tux, you can even go naked like your pets. Unleash your party animal at my animal party. Guests you know from Animal Planet, TV, radio, the news, and bookstores will be joining me. And that's because after I won Best Pet Radio in America from the DWAA, I got my paw in the door and I met a lot of amazing people. And the best of the best are going to be coming to the party. They're coming to party with us. So join us at the animal party. Don't miss the party. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Lee, you've given us some marvelous information and really debunking a lot of myths that people have, like garlic. It's very safe and is going to repel fleas, or B vitamins are going to repel fleas and mosquitoes. And I found, and you're right, they just don't seem to work. But there's a lot of urban legends that people go, oh, you know, they read it on the internet, and I can't use such and such a product in my home because it's toxic to animals. Swiffer wet jets is such a product. What has been found, you being with Pet Poison Hotline, what have you found with these Swiffer wet jet products? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, there's so much um, internet hype that can happen out there. And so you definitely want to check with um, the experts in the field. So when in doubt, you want to make sure you're getting your information from a credible site. And that's why we recommend people go to our website or go to a veterinarian's website where that information is referenced by scientific publications. There have been studies that have been done um, by experts in the veterinary toxicology field that basically said that Swiffer does not cause those problems. It doesn't cause the liver failure that that some people had reported. And the hard thing is that you could have a dog that happens to have liver failure that coincidentally is exposed to X, Y, and Z, and it doesn't necessarily mean that A led to B. So you definitely have to be careful. The Swiffer myth has been debunked. And, you know, I use Swiffer in my house and I feel comfortable using it. I have two cats and one dog. But again, I'm always, always safe. I always keep my pets in a separate area. I always make sure that there's fans going, that the area is well ventilated. Um, so when in doubt, check with a veterinarian, check with Pet Poison Helpline, check with appropriate references on the Internet. And um, especially important that people don't spread the hype if it's not medically accurate. And does this also hold true for Breeze? That was another one that said, oh, you can't use that around your pet. Right. You know, it also stems from um, the same Internet myths and rumors out there. 
I would say I would not use Febreze um, directly, obviously, on a pet or a pet's bed until the product is completely dried. I wouldn't let my pet be re-exposed. And again, it's just from a safety viewpoint. Again, there are concerns with cats, so we definitely want to make sure they have birds completely out of the area when there's any kind of uh, fragrance in the environment. But for the most part, that has also been debunked as a myth when it comes to cats and dogs. You'd mentioned birds again, made me think about a a situation where a client brought in, it was an an indoor bird, it was a type of a parrot, I can't remember what kind, and she was going to be cleaning, so she decided she was going to let the bird be outside in its cage, get a little sunshine, this was great, and she cleaned, and of course it usually seems to happen, you clean one thing, and then, oh, you see another, and then you get distracted, and you clean one more thing, oh, let me do this too, and by the time she remembered, oh, The bird's been outside for a couple of hours. I better go find it. The sun had moved. The bird had been in direct sunlight for several hours. And the bird eventually died because it had gotten heat stroke. And she was just trying to do a nice thing to let the bird be outside. So be careful if you take your pets outside, cat or dog even, Uh, especially dogs. Sometimes you'll tether it in an area going, well, it was great in the morning. Think of where the sun's going to be later on in the afternoon, too. Yes, so important. You know, and it goes back to the original, whenever you let your pets or your children outside, you always ideally want to do it supervised because I've seen cats and dogs tangled and strangled um, on leashes or leads because they're unsupervised outside. So when in doubt, you always want to make sure your pet's supervised outside. And always has water. Yes. Well, some of the things that are outside that come inside, especially this time of year, are going to be those little rodents. So you're going to have the little mice and rats that are coming into the home. And this can happen even in the nicest of areas. Rodenticides. There are rodenticides that are absolutely great at killing rodents, but they're also very good at killing the cat or dog that ingests part of that little creature. Dr. Lee, can you give us some background information as to the types of rodenticides that are out on the market right now and what people need to be concerned with aware of? Sure. When in doubt, dogs and cats will get into anything. And I know that from personal experience because once I put a block of green mouse poison underneath the dresser in an area where my cat couldn't get it, came back five minutes later, my cat was playing with it. (laughs) So they're more flexible than you think. So even though you think you put it in a place that's pet proof, it may not be. And so when it comes to rat or mouse poisons, you definitely want to pick the right poison. Because some are reversible and some have an antidote and some do not at all. And so there's about four to five different types. So one of the most common ones is the one that causes internal bleeding. And the antidote for that is vitamin K. It's a prescription medication available from your vet. I have to say it, but that's actually the best, safest one to use because it's the one with an antidote. The other types of rat poisons don't have an antidote and they can cause severe seizures. They can actually be dangerous to you potentially. And some of them can even cause really severe kidney failure. So if you're going to use a mouse or rat poison, I always recommend using the good old-fashioned mouse traps because once they've actually killed a mouse, it's more humane. Um, It usually does it in a quick fashion where it it humanely puts them um, out of their misery and there's no poison directly in your house. If you can't use mouse traps or you don't feel comfortable doing them, um, they actually have secured black box mouse traps so you don't have to see it and your pet can't accidentally step on it either. If you use the other types, again, check for the ones that have an antidote, typically those that have vitamin K. The good thing to know is that most cats are actually usually pretty resistant to the rat poison that causes internal bleeding, which is good. How Um, would you know if it's a reversible type that has an antidote? Yep. Just look on the back of the box, and if it says vitamin K1, that's usually the one with the antidote, or it says it causes internal breathing. Talk to your veterinarian. Talk to Pet Poison Helpline. There's so many different types, and they may come under the same brand name, so you have to be careful about which poison that you pick. It has been frustrating because people will bring in a pet. Oh, it's just not feeling good. It just kind of has the blahs. We'll take a look at it, and many times the gums will be very pale. And they're not seeing any external signs. No vomiting, no diarrhea, just kind of lethargic, 
pale, not wanting to eat, and we start asking questions, oh, no, you know, we don't have any rat bait out, but your neighbors might. So Mm -hmm. if you have neighbors and you know that you have a a rat and mouse situation going on in your neighborhood, you may want to gently ask your neighbors, please, if you're going to put out anything, make sure that it's one that's relatively safe. You'd mentioned the mouse traps work well. Sticky traps, a lot of people who want to, you know, just... Ooh, they're, they're Buddhist at heart and don't want to kill anything. Mm-hmm. Sticky traps, if you can find that little mouse or rat after it's kind of walked across and gotten itself stuck, you can take it to a field somewhere else. Use mineral oil or vegetable oil just to kind of slide the mouse off and it can go off and do its little mouse thing someplace else and you haven't actually killed it. Yeah, you know, the hard thing is that um, obviously as veterinarians, we want things to, if you're going to use a mouse trap or you're going to use any kind of mouse poison, you want it to be the most humane way possible for any species. And the problem is that I generally try not to advocate using the, those mouse or rat poisons. I'd rather use a trap um, instead because, again, it's more humane. There's no poison in the house, and there's no what we call relay poisoning. Relay poisoning is when you have this mouse or rat poison out, it kills all the mice, and then your cat eats it or your dog eats it, or more importantly, wildlife eat it. This is one of the biggest ways that raptors or birds of prey, like red-tailed hawks or eagles, are actually poisoned. The good thing is it's pretty hard to poison a dog and a cat by relay toxicity. They have to have a whole stomach full of mice before it's an issue, but it does affect the wildlife out there. So when in doubt, you do have to keep that in mind also. Great idea because, yes, that raptor goes, oh, look at that little mouse. It's not moving very quickly. That's an easy one for me to catch. So, yes, yes, that's one that is dying because people like using these rodenticides that cause internal bleeding because it's clean. You didn't have to see that little dead rat body caught in the trap, but you're correct. It's much more humane. It's faster, and you don't have to worry about down the line what's going to happen to the next one. Well, let's get out of the house because we've been doing lots of cleaning and now we want to go hiking with our dog out in the wilds and have a good time and let that dog stretch its little paws. But um, there's snakes out there and rattlesnakes uh, seem to be a problem this time of year. The young rattlesnakes don't seem to know how to control themselves, so they'll oftentimes release all of their toxin into that bite wound itself. There is now these vaccines that are rattlesnake vaccines. And you and I were chatting before we went on air about our experience with these vaccines. Could you tell our listeners what your feelings are? Sure. My general recommendation is prevention, prevention, prevention. And so the best way to prevent a rattlesnake bite is if you live in a location where there's a lot of rattlesnakes, so the Four Corners area, Southern California, Arizona, places like that, Colorado, keep your dog on a leash while you're hiking. Just because dogs are curious, so they're going to see that rattlesnake and run up to them and get bitten on the face. So when in doubt, always keep your dog supervised on a leash. That's the easiest way for you to keep your pet safe. Okay. Um, when it comes to rattlesnakes, it's important to keep in mind that you don't want to do anything um, without talking to a vet or a pet poison helpline. You don't want to put a tourniquet on. You don't want to cut the limb and suck the venom out. All those things actually make your pet and you worse. So when in doubt, just get to medical help right away. Okay. In terms of the vaccine, you have to keep in mind that the vaccine, um, there's a couple vaccines out there, but you have to keep in mind that they're made from one type of rattlesnake, antivenin. And so it's not protective for all the rattlesnakes out there in the world. Okay. With the vaccine, if you think that your dog is highly exposed, in other words, you're out hiking in Colorado or in Texas and you're exposed to rattlesnakes all the time, your pet's exposed all the time, in general, the vaccine has gone through a lot of debate, but people actually, or veterinarians actually think that it reduces the clinical severity of the signs. So, in general, it usually means that your pet's not going to be hospitalized for quite as long. It may not be quite as expensive. Your your pet may not need as many bottles or doses of anti-venom. Um, so, it's something that I would discuss with your vet. If your dog is a weekend warrior where he's hardly outside and, you know, he only hikes once in a while, they're a smaller breed dog that you're going to keep on leash. Those are not breeds or not situations where I would recommend it unless you're in a really high epidemic region of rattlesnakes. 
I totally agree with you that uh, we find in my own practice in Southern California, I will tell my clients that it hopefully will buy you some time to get your pet to a veterinarian, get it to an emergency clinic if you think there has been a bite. And it may be, you know, I'm not really sure. Maybe it's a little bit swollen. I really don't see any wounds, but I heard it. And then all of a sudden the dog yelped. When in doubt, seek medical attention quickly because it can be very injurious just at the site of the bite. I've had animals who've had major sloughs of skin, the skin, the tissue underneath it will die. And then it's going to be an ongoing problem for sometimes weeks. So I love your idea. Keep it on a leash, even though you go, but I want it to have fun and, and stretch its paws. Running into things like snakes, it's not a lot of fun. Right. And another important thing to keep in mind is just because you think your dog was bitten, definitely take them to a vet. The good thing is, and I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't bank on this, but about 20% of rattlesnake bites are dry bites. So you scared the rattlesnake, they bit you or your pet, and they may not have even released any venom. So there's a one in four chance your pet might be lucky, but it's so dangerous, you can never take that chance. So when in doubt, always call your veterinarian, always bring your pet into the veterinarian right away for assessment. And when they had a question and they're going to call Pet Poison Hotline, tell us about the service. Who mans it? Sure. Why is it different than calling a human poison control? Great question. You know, a lot of human poison controls won't even answer pet questions to begin with, and that's because they're state or federally funded. Because animal poison controls aren't state or federally funded, unfortunately, we do require a small per incident fee of $35 per incident, but that's for us to discuss the case with both your veterinarian and the pet owner for the whole duration of the case, regardless of how many phone calls that is. And it's a good investment because sometimes you may find out that your pet's not actually poisoned or the substance wasn't actually poisonous, so it may save you a vet visit. The number for it is 1-800-213-6680. And Pet Poison Helpline is actually based out of Minneapolis. And we're international. They use us in the United Kingdom. They use us in Canada. Um, they use us in certain parts of um, the United States territories, like the Caribbean area also. And we're made up of veterinarians, veterinary technicians, pharmacologists, clinical toxicologists, board-certified veterinary specialists, including internal medicine, emergency critical care, and veterinary toxicology. So you're definitely talking with the experts out there in terms of any kind of poisoning. Now, Dr. Lee, is this just for cats and dogs? It's actually for all species, birds, ferrets, horses, cattle, pigs. The majority of our calls are dogs and cats, but we we handle phone calls for all species. So this is a real lifesaver for our pets. Yeah, it can be, and that's why I generally recommend um, when in doubt, contact your vet, contact Pet Poison Helpline, and have those numbers pre-programmed in your cell phone so when you're stressed out in the middle of an emergency, you can call right away for help. Great information. Well, Dr. Justine Lee, thank you so much for helping us today, giving us some good information. If we're going to get out there and clean the house, how to do it safely around our pets and also for ourselves. It's very important. You've been listening to The Pet Doctor. I'm Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you've learned a little bit today to help you be the best pet owner that you possibly can be. Any questions, always ask your primary care veterinarian. You get good information from that person. That's what we're trained to do. So thank you so much. Please listen again next week when we'll have more information for you and your pet. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.